we are now living much more in line with our values. But we didn't set out to do that. That's sort of been a, a byproduct. And we didn't set out to live like this. We just knew what we were turning away from. We knew that we didn't want to be part of a culture that was destroying the world, but we didn't have where we are now as a goal in mind. Welcome to the Mahasoma podcast, a space to learn and unlearn, to explore the deeper truths of life and to live them as the new normal. Hey everyone, welcome back. I'm Laura Poole, Vedic meditation teacher at Mahasoma. And today we have a brilliant, thought-provoking, challenging, and just effing awesome episode. As you can probably tell, I'm a little bit excited about this one. And uh, I also feel it's a really relevant time to be sharing this with everyone. As in our current reality, many of us may be feeling lost or unsure fearful or surrounded by overwhelming negativity about what the future is going to be. In response, this episode is both a breath of fresh air and a guiding light for what is possible when we come together, are open to change and really listen to the wisdom of nature. We all need role models in our lives, those who have already started to live in the new story. And our next guest is 200% that. And so let me introduce you to Meg Ullman from Artist as Family. Meg lives with her husband, Patrick, their sons, Woody and Zephyr, and their dog, Zero, in Dalesford, Victoria, on a quarter acre permaculture plot. It's home to their School of Applied Neo-Peasantry at Tree Elbow University on Jara People's Country. They live a life of deep connection to nature and community, teaching radical neo-peasant homemaking, community economy making, and other accountable living skills. Meg and her family share their way of living through blogging, making videos, writing, creating art, poetry, and music, and they also teach permaculture living courses. Speaking with Meg was so inspiring. Her realness... Her heart and devotion was deeply felt. And the conclusion I came to is that the way she is living with her family, in community, on country, is the true expression of Veda. Veda means nature. And when you live so intimately with nature, Veda reveals itself to you spontaneously. You learn the way of harmony, the knowledge of nature, the wisdom of being, And it simply becomes your lived experience. In this episode, we explore a lot that I'm not going to be able to list here, but to get a little taste of what's coming, we start off with Meg's awakening to the real state of the world and how that information was the catalyst that propelled them to change the way they were living. We speak about permaculture, the unlearning, growing up and upskilling that is required and about unschooling our kids, teaching ecological literacy to the next generation. We explore the magic of compost, learning from our first peoples and their connection to country, the importance of dismantling patriarchy, capitalism and neoliberalism to reclaim community and connection. And we finish up with how to get started living a permaculture life, the importance of belonging the complexity of living on unceded land, divesting from capitalist systems, and the one thing you can do right now to begin the change. There are a lot of resources and links we have put into the show notes for this episode, so please make sure you check these out. Head to mahasoma.com forward slash podcast, click on episode 12, and everything will be there for you. All right, let's do this. Welcome to composting capitalism and reclaiming ourselves as empowered, ecological creatures of place with Meg Ullman from Artist's Family. You guys live on, you live, you live on a quarter acre property in Dalesford and it's a full permaculture, full permaculture setup. Yes, it is. 
So when we moved here uh, about 14 years ago-ish, wow. um, it was a vacant block and I had never heard of permaculture. I grew up in Melbourne in the Burbs yeah. um, for the most part. Uh, we did spend some time in Israel and I lived on a kibbutz and that's another part of the story. <sighs> but we, yeah, we knew that we wanted to put fruit trees in the ground. We wanted to grow some food. We wanted to have some chickens and have a place to call our own, Mm -hmm. um, which includes all of the complications and challenges and contradictions that that encompasses living on unceded, stolen country. Mm. Um, But when we moved here, we had a very clear vision of how we wanted to live and all of that changed very, very suddenly and very, very slowly because of our awakening and our watching and our understanding and our listening and our reclaiming. Yeah, I guess it started, there was a whole series of documentary films that we watched mm-hmm. um, that maybe these days wouldn't seem so radical, mm. but the the most confronting one was a film called The World According to Monsanto mm. and it was in the ilk of uh, Food Inc and those kinds of films that came out much later. There was a film uh, with Vandana Shiva called Bullshit. Mm. There was a film that some uh, young uh, science students made in the States called King Corn. All these kinds of uh, f- mainly food-related yeah. documentaries that we watched and, you know, we were cross-referencing, we were listening to podcasts, we were reading books, we were reading articles, we were watching TED Talks, we were speaking to people in our community and just this picture, this shape of the world was felt like it was changing before our eyes and that the, the earth was shaken up and moving under our feet because we thought that the world was one thing and really big business and government and all of us as complicit citizens of capital Mm. were working and playing and existing in a world that was something else. And I think we, yeah, it was a big wake-up call for us and we had weeks of grief, about a week of numbness. Mm. We didn't know what to do what do we do with this information that how could this evil how could this this focus on disconnection and separation prevail it mm. it didn't feel didn't fit right with our hearts because you know when you're growing up and you think the world is one way and i was in my early 30s so i wasn't a teenager mm. but it was a a big shake up for us to how and a real um a very big time of assessment for us to work out what our priorities were and who who we were, who we are in the face of a world that has different values to ours. Mm-hmm. And it was a real coming together of us as a couple because we weren't, we, we yeah, we were renting, we both had rental properties when we both, uh, first got together, Patrick and I. We both had full-time jobs. We both shopped at supermarkets. We both had cars. Yeah, we weren't typical consumers, but we were we were consumers. We were we didn't have time to be making, to be growing, to be fixing things like we wanted to, but we didn't know that at the time. Yeah. Um, we were just thought we were just a regular couple, and we were. What led you to start watching? the documentaries like was there some crisis point or how did you get to going well is maybe the world isn't what I thought it was I think it was curiosity more than anything Hmm. I don't think we we set out to investigate anything specific I think it was just our areas of interest we started growing our own food Hmm. and that felt like a um, an area that we were interested in. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, we started going to uh, local film nights here. There's a, a group called Hepburn Relocalization Network, which is uh, part of our, like, part of the Transition Town 
network yeah and I can talk a little bit about that yeah um, yeah like. I've done a yeah. bit of exploring on transition town yeah beautiful yeah. we can yeah. chat about that um yeah so we started going to um our HRN Hepburn Relocalization Network film nights they had solstice nights and um different we would have different workshops on how to make different things um so they did have a number of film nights so they were all very positive the HRN films and a lot of the ones that we were watching weren't so positive. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, we had both, Patrick and I had both been activists in our different fields um, before we got together. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, we, we were never really interested in Netflix and Hollywood films. You know, we've watched, we've watched a handful, <laughs> but they've never really been either of our things. We've much more been interested in alternative views and alternative voices. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we just started watching lots of different films across all kinds of genres. Mm. But the ones, I guess, that had the greatest impact were this whole sway of documentaries that we watched. Mm. So curiosity kind of led you to have the veils, the veils yes. pulled back. Mm. Yes, yes. Mm. Very nice. And then you ended up, so you're on your quarter acre in Dalesford. Yep. Let's chat a little bit about, um, yeah, beginning the beginning days of that. So the beginning days were, well, Patrick grew up in the Southern Highlands of New South Wales. So he grew up on on the land, whereas I grew up in the Burbs for the most part in Melbourne. And we had an acre in the suburbs, which was um, remarkable, really. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that still hasn't been subdivided. Mm. Um, so mum grew veggies. We had um, fruit trees. We had... Um, swimming pools. We were outside a lot, um, but I didn't pay attention. And it's one of my regrets that I didn't say to my mum, so what are you doing there? And so once you put the, you know, the um, the scraps in the compost bin, what, what happens then? I just <laughs> resented having to carry this icky bucket out to the stinky worm farm. <laughs> <laughs> um, so for me, moving onto this quarter acre I, I had a lot of growing up to do. I had a lot of skilling up to do mm. and a lot of unlearning what I thought a woman was supposed to do. Mm. And I had a view of myself as a feminist and a feminist was somebody who was out there in the workforce and she wasn't at home. She was not necessarily climbing the corporate ladder, but she was earning the buck so she could be independent so she didn't have to rely on a man. Mm. And it took me a long time to to work out what I actually did want and what it meant for me personally as a human being, as a woman on the earth at this very juncture in history, what what do I want? What is important to me? And I had, did have a lot of unlearning to do and a lot of relearning and a lot of just going, trying to go very easy on myself that I, I was cross with myself that it had taken me so long to get here that I was in my early 30s and it's like, why didn't I start this journey earlier and I wasted all this time? And it's like, well, we can only arrive when we arrive and there's no, there's no point being upset with myself. Mm. That's, that's not helpful. Mm. Yes. Yeah, so the, the early days were, yeah, looking at what was important to me, looking at what was important to us as a couple and as a family. Patrick's got an older boy who was four when we got together and he's now 18. Mm. Um, yeah, you guys so were all living together on the we land? Were. Yes. So he, so Zephyr, his, his name is, so he was living with us for half the week back then. So okay. a week with us and a week, so half a week with us, half a week with his mum. Yeah. And yeah, navigating life as a stepmom yeah. and in a relationship that was quite nuanced and complicated as, you know, step families can be. Mm. Yeah. Trying to work out, I knew when I worked and lived in Melbourne, I knew what my strengths were, I knew what my gifts were and how I was able to contribute to the world in a way that felt um, reciprocal and that I, was, I could give my efforts and I would be rewarded monetarily. Mm-hmm. I knew what 
I knew how I was in that world, but in the new world of living on the land, what what was my role? I had no no practical skills. You know, I could type press releases and I could answer emails, um, but I didn't know what you know. I didn't know about soil structure. I didn't know why anyone would face their house north. I didn't know how to save asparagus seeds. I didn't know why anyone would mulch a tree. I I didn't know the very, very basics. And I was embarrassed (laughs) for a long time, very ashamed that I had grown up and I couldn't fend for myself. Yeah. In in yeah, in on the land, in in a way that really mattered. And that's what we're learning here, you know, having only been on our land for about eight months or so, we're having to learn everything. And, you know, <laughs> the fact that neither of us, you know, Alex and I, my partner, um, we have like no carpentry skills, uh, don't really have any, as you were saying, um, skills in understanding how soil works, when you plant the seeds, uh, how to harvest, mm-hmm. how to look after the land. Like we are learning all of this from scratch and you know we talk about education and maybe this will be a whole a whole other podcast but around the yeah the lack of education that we're given from a young age that would actually sustain us as human beings but also sustain the environment regenerate ourselves and regenerate the environment and what you're saying is exactly the reason why we are unschooling an unschooling family because we want our kids to know how to what what being part of the world the living of the world really means mm. what does it mean to be a participant what does it mean to have you know they talk about literacy what about ecological literacy what about that first and foremost as as a way to relate to the world that the kids learn first so woody who's 18 a week he doesn't know how to read and write but he know you give him a piece of wood and he'll tell you what kind of tree it came from. I mean, his ecological literacy has so far surpassed mine. It's really um, remarkable and it's exactly what I wanted for my child. Yeah, so wonderful. And you homeschool, well, we call it, you'd call it unschooling? Yes. So homeschool is when they still have lessons And so you have designated time, okay, now we're going to sit down, we're going to have an English class or a maths class or a science class, whereas unschooling is they just go with the flow of whatever's happening in our days. So we don't have a curriculum at all. So it's all child-led learning. So, Mm -hmm. you know, we're not sitting around playing PlayStation Mm -hmm. or things like that. You know, we're we're doing, um, we're participating in our own form of culture making in a very specific way Mm. and he's picking up on that and he's finding his roles and his interests and his path to learning. I mean, we don't have to say, okay, now we're going to learn this. Kids just learn. We all just learn when we're, when we're watching, when we're part of something that's meaningful and interesting to us. And, you know, he's got his interests. He's really interested in, um, in hunting at the moment so he's making all kinds of crossbows and bow and arrows and um slingshots Mm. and he had a whole lot of marbles that people had given him for the slingshot and he used all of them and lost in the garden somewhere and so now he goes down to the creek and gets a whole lot of just just behind our house and gets a whole lot of clay and he rolls them into balls and he puts them on a baking tray and whenever we bake our bread which is a couple of times a week he'll put them in the oven afterwards when it's still really hot and he'll fire them mm-hmm. and now he's got his own you know millions and unlimited <laughs> amounts of marvels that he makes but this is all his own learning this is his you know his learning about clay and the soil type and the water and how he has to massage the clay first or else all of the balls explode which has happened on a number of occasions Mm. and how close and how to and of course when you're hunting and he's hunting rabbits and he's hunting uh, blackbirds that are digging up our garden Mm. he's he's learning how to be in relationship to this animal that he's that he's preying on and he's watching and observing and what times of the day they come into the garden and what they like to eat and how close he can get and if they're 
if he can get closer to them, like if they're scared of his sound or his sight more, you know, just these things, just observing and interacting with these animals, just what he's learning is really, it's unquantifiable in the NAPLAN, in the NAPLAN world. 100%. And the, um, the subtle sensory perception that he would be developing and that connection to his own intuition. And then the word that came up as well was confidence like mm. having such a confidence in himself because so many kids come out of school, you know, traditional schooling, um, and they may know a lot of stuff, but they don't have this confidence in who they are, who they mm. are in the world. Because there's, there, I mean, I, I can only really speak for myself in the schooling system and I went to conventional schools mm. and then on to university and there wasn't really time for me to just be particularly at primary school his age like he you know a bell rings and you've got to drop what you're doing no matter how much intent and interest and concentration you have in that project and you've got to go on to the next thing and he wakes up when he wants he goes to bed you know relatively well you know he goes to bed at eight o'clock um the day the day is his to unfold into as soon as he wakes up so incredible and it's teaching um like independence and it's teaching um autonomy yeah autonomy but that um self-determine yeah self-determine self-determine <laughs> just having that connection to self we talk a lot about mm. this in, in meditation about not being like self-actualize yeah yeah self-actualization yeah uh to have the and i keep using the word confidence but it's a confidence in knowing who and what you are and having mm. that deep connection knowing that wisdom comes from within and not being reliant on other people uh, or experiences to reflect back to you your self-worth. Mm. I think a big part is the honouring of making mistakes. Mm. And that's been a really big thing for me as well as I, as I learnt skills and made a lot of mistakes and planted things in the wrong place and, you know, we just dug it up and planted it somewhere else the next year. And that also turned out to be a mistake, you know, and just sort of it's like this is how we learn and I really see that with him. This is how he learns and just it's all a process. It's not the final end result with a smiley face sticker because you got it right. It's like this is, you know, there's a massive process of learning to get there. Oh, so good. We teach you all about this. And, you know, when, when I'm sharing, you know, the Vedic wisdom with people who come and learn to meditate, we speak about being process orientated, not outcome mm. orientated, mm. you know, honoring your intuition and not doing things because intellectually you know that it's good for you or you should be doing it, but really sensing in and going, what is needed right now? Mm. What is my relationship to this to this present moment? Um, and how to notice when your uh, internal environment is starting to go out of balance so you can start bringing it back into balance before you're in full-blown fight or flight or you're, you know, yelling at someone or, you know, your whole life has collapsed. And, you know, we're saying, can you imagine if this was taught to kids? Imagine if that was the you know curriculum in a way where you're just building these skills of being self-realized, self-actualized, understanding the world you live in, the land you live on, and being in, in many ways self-sufficient, but within community. So I've got to yeah. make that little distinction there. <laughs> self-sufficient of the land within your community. Oh, what a different generation would grow up in this world. Yep. Agreed. Uh, um, so you're on your land. You're there in the first first little part, learning and unlearning. What are some of the biggest lessons, the biggest learnings that took place that really shaped the direction of your life? That time, linear time, is a construct. Mm. That the weeks and months are all made up. That was so, when I had that realisation, it was huge. <laughs> like, wow. Because <laughs> I had always been a watch wearer and then I took it off. And I still like to wear a watch sometimes. It's like, okay, this is, this is how it feels again. Mm. But to be part of cyclical time and be part of 
I feel like that really helped me tune into the seasons, mm. to um, my circadian rhythm, mm. yeah, and to myself as an ecological creature. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah, that was that was a really big a big learning, unlearning and relearning. Mm-hmm. And how did that impact your your daily living? Like having this realization of, you know, one of the fundamental <laughs> pieces of wisdom of life there is only yeah. now. <laughs> yes. Um I think it was more of how I saw myself in relation to the world. Mm. And we all have our time to bud and we all have our time to bloom and we all have our time to go to seed and we all have our time to decompose and then go back into the earth and then regenerate into the next form. Mm. I think it was more to do with that a refocusing on a different kind of time. I mean, yes, we had I had deadlines still because I was still working and still do work in the monetary economy and I still had to be at work at a certain time and I was writing articles in those early days uh, for a local magazine and I had to have them in by a certain time. Mm. But it was good to be able to work within both worlds Mm. and to see myself moving as I moved from the time of deadline into the time of the flow. Mm. I'm about to teach a whole um, advanced wisdom session in a couple of weeks oh, wow. on the Vedic worldview of time from, oh, the di- wow. from the different layers of reality, one being linear time, another yep. being time that is experienced um, as a vertical concept, meaning um, to get to the past, we go deeper within ourselves. Mm-hmm. That's where the past lives. And then you've got the layer of time in which there actually is no time there is only now there's this present moment and it's a continuum a continuum Mm. of presence yes I mean it all goes back to compost (laughs) (laughs) oh yes keep talking please (laughs) I mean isn't compost magical and for me that was I'd grown up, as I said, carrying the stinky compost <laughs> compost bucket to the worm farm. Um, and I th- that was because that's pretty much all the experience that I had. I started from there in my skill learning and I saw that compost is magic mm. and when you can turn anything that, has been alive back into healthy, living, biodiverse, give, yeah, health-giving soil that, to create more life, but that we are, we are made up of compost. Mm. Exactly what you were just saying about all of the different elements of our experiences and our remembrances and our, um, our hopes and our fears and our um, senses of alienation our connection or disconnection to the world I mean it's all it's all part of us Mm -hmm. and when I was really um, embedding myself in becoming one with the idea of compost and how to and how to really make a good healthful compost I was also honoring myself as a compost peep of everything of everything that that had ever happened to me that I had made happen that I the privilege that I was born born into the shame that I had felt when I really realized what our the culture that I was a part of was doing to the world and to to the waters and to the mountains and to Indigenous people to non-Indigenous people to all the ecosystems mm-hmm. and biomes of the world. Yeah, all of that was being composted and I felt like when we started watching The World According to Monsanto and all those other films and I was stuck in this grief and these terrible feelings of guilt and really honouring myself as a compost heap (laughs) helped me to come out of that 
and to be able to see myself as as a empowered participant in the world Mm -hmm. and that yeah but I felt like the grief that time of grief was hugely important Mm. as a massive rupturing I mean I now at the time I didn't know how I could get out of it and we really Patrick and I were both feeling that sense at the same time and it was very important for us to be able to share that Mm -hmm. and to go deep into that grief together and we really found permaculture as a way out of that mm. and a way into the living of the world that we really wanted to be a part of. I was watching a uh, documentary uh, about the history of permaculture with David Holmgren and in it he was speaking about uh, how back in the you know 70s when it was just getting, getting started and uh, all the challenges that we were facing back then, similar things that we're facing now, and they thought, you know, we could keep keep fighting this, you know, keep protesting, keep, you know, going, well, we don't want this and we don't want that. Well, actually, what if instead we just created what we do want and what, what would that look like? And that kind of, in many ways was, was the seed from which permaculture emerged. And I, I feel like in permaculture, there is that creative, um, emerging, inspiring quality to it which is very charming. <laughs> and I like uh, Patrick, the way he talks about permaculture is that first peoples who are born onto country all around the world, that they traditionally have a set of ethics and values and principles that connect them with you know, kinship ties to different people, to, you know, they're land bonded. And then With us, there has been, as second peoples, there's been a massive rupturing of that Mm -hmm. and permaculture is a way for second peoples and land disconnected first peoples as a way back into that connection with country. Mm. Yeah, and that really that sits so well with me. Mm. Anything more with time you wanted to add? I love growing up. (laughs) I mean, I love growing up. I love growing older. Mm. Of course, you know, it's especially with the pandemic at the moment, we're all so vulnerable. Mm. And to be able to have another day of being alive is so precious Mm. and such a gift. Um, But I think my early discoveries about time were more to seeing myself just as, as part of the grander scheme of things Mm. and I don't mean that in a heroic sense at all Mm. quite the opposite but it was looking at the trees around our property and seeing them as bearing witness to the world and but as participants of course they're not they're not stagnant inert beings (laughs) and seeing myself as that is that is my role too and I love that permaculture has a focus on mimicking ecology and mimicking mimicking uh perennial Mm. forests and you know what can we learn from trees what can we learn from forests that biodiversity is good Mm. and to adapt in situ, that they can't just walk across the, f- <laughs> the road because there's more water over there. Mm. You know, they might send roots over there. And, of course, what science now knows about the root systems is what Indigenous people have known for thousands of years, thousands thousands of years, about reciprocity and the passing of information along mycelial networks and how they look after each other from their own their own kin and then non-family member <laughs> trees mm. um the passing sugars passing waters passing things yeah to each other and just what that means for us to share our gifts to share our knowledges it's a commons we're part of a commons mm. and 
you know, patriarchy, capitalism, neoliberalism, all of these impositions have tried to teach us otherwise. Mm -hmm. And looking at time differently definitely helped see myself as part of, you know, the, the world is a living, growing, breathing entity, whether it's Gaia or whether it's just, you know, more from the animus perspective that everything is alive. Mm-hmm. And I've definitely become an animist mm-hmm. over these last 14 years mm-hmm. and seen myself, you know, everything is living and everything has a right to its, its own sovereignty. And to take that away from an animal by putting it in a cage or, you know, enslaving another person, we're doing that to ourselves. Mm. So the way you live now is quite different to how you lived 14 years ago. Yes. What are some of those differences? So, yeah, I haven't shopped at a supermarket for over a decade. Um, Patrick and I both had cars when we got together and we sold those over a decade ago. Mm. We don't have a lot of stuff. (laughs) We... We don't buy a lot of new things. We do buy some new things, but really putting an emphasis on the fair share part of the permaculture ethic of earth care, people care, fair share, Mm. and seeing our privilege. And I feel like the word privilege these days has been weaponized Mm. and used as a very negative or you're just privileged. It's like the more privilege we have, the greater our responsibility Mm -hmm. and we take that very seriously. We take it seriously as second peoples living on first peoples country and what is our responsibility to our land, to our inverted commas land, our quarter acre and the common land around us and to all land and all people Mm -hmm. and not having a car has been so liberating yeah. um, in that it has really made us, we don't have to earn $15,000 a year mm. which is when you have a car, which is depreciation, mm. registration, petrol, servicing, fines, <laughs> all of that stuff. <laughs> we don't have to find anymore, So, which means we can less work, We can work less in the monetary economy and have more time and having more time just to breathe into whether it's Hmm. whether we're learning skills, whether we're practicing those skills, whether we're being in the garden, being together as a family, just means that we can play music together. This don't have the the guilt of that there's no scarce there's no scarcity of time. And to raise your kids with that, with that, there's no rush. There's no rushing around. There's no quick, let's do it this way because we're, it's quicker this way. It's like, mm. why? why? Why do we need to do that? Why do we need to go the quickest way, do things the quickest way when that's not the most enjoyable way or that's not the, the prettiest way or that's not the mm. easiest way? So when we first got together, we were time poor. We would go out for breakfast on the weekends because it was a nice thing to do. We'd sit and read the paper and have people cook for us at the cafe. <laughs> and then when we started to grow our, grow our own food, we, and it started off with our chicken's eggs one morning when we were out for breakfast, and I said, oh, these eggs, we can make it better at home. Maybe next time we come we could bring our own eggs with us and ask if they could cook them. And then we started making our own bread. <laughs> and then it's like, well, maybe we could ask, them, we could bring our own bread and ask them to toast it. And then we started <laughs> um, getting, get 10 litres of raw cow's milk a week. And then we started making our own butter and cheese. It's like, well, maybe we could <laughs> ask them, we could just bring all the ingredients. And then we stopped drinking coffee. It's like, well, what are we even going out for? <laughs> and so it's interesting. Um, habits we have like oh it's a treat it's like it's Mm. I'll treat myself because I've spent all my time doing this really important work or this really hard work and so I'm going to go and treat myself and then we treat ourselves but 
it's not as quality it's not as high quality as what you could either make yourself at home or you eat something that's probably not that great for you, but you eat it because it's a treat. And I find mm. it so strange, this whole idea of treating yourself with things that are actually not that great for you, but you think you deserve them because you've worked really hard. Like it's all an interesting, <laughs> when you when you view it from that perspective, you're like, hang on a second, what are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And also the whole notion of working outside the home to pay your rent or your mortgage on the home that you don't spend a lot of time in and then as a treat you go out of the home again when to really flip that and put the focus on the home economy and it feels quite radical to say a woman's place is in the home mm. and a man's place is in the home too mm. because also it was the men who were um, enticed out of the home first because they were sent down the mines, they were sent into the factories, they were sent off to war, and then the women were, quote, unquote, stuck at home. Mm. And that feels like a funny thing to say now when we're in lockdown. <laughs> um, but, yeah, but the whole notion of gadgets and processed foods and white goods to make our lives easier because we're stuck at home are completely disconnecting us from the labors of love and of being at home mm. yeah and the more the more of these concepts and the more of these white goods and the more things time saving mm. machines that we have given up yeah reclaiming ourselves as ecological creatures has been vital because we've we've been we put ourselves back into ecological time mm. because if we're not cars are anti-ecological of course because you're racing through time and space at a speed that is not natural I hate driving by the way <laughs> I, I barely leave lockdown's been a kind of amazing for me because it means I don't have to leave I don't have to leave the house to go anywhere yes. I drive and I I can literally feel in my body physical body that like it's it's the energy body is kind of still back at home even though my yes. physical body has arrived here driving's definitely not my thing so I completely feel that yes and we're a big bike riding family mm. and even more so a big walking family mm. so about seven years ago we wanted to go on a holiday. Uh, Patrick and, yeah, so Patrick and I had been together seven years and we had that seven-year itch. It's like, okay, so let's let's do something. Let's go on an adventure. So we packed up our kids in our house and <laughs> we rented out our house and we uh, rode our bikes as a family from here in uh, central Victoria um, up to uh, Cape York. What? <laughs> <laughs> So we were away for 400 days. So we rode there and most of the way back um, on our bicycles and we free camped and we foraged and we hunted and we gleaned and we bartered for most of our food. Mm. And we had weeks where we didn't spend anything and we just drifted. We had, we just knew we wanted to go north. Mm. And there were five of us on two bikes, so two kids and our dog. <laughs> <laughs> and so Woody, um, who's nearly eight, he, uh, was a baby, so he was 14 months. He wasn't walking yet. Wow. So he And we were away for 14 months, so quite literally he had half his life on the back of a bike. Huh. And we sang and we drifted and we, yeah, we just... Every day was such an adventure. And because we had the focus of food and finding our own food and foraging and learning new different wild species of autonomously growing food, um, yeah, we had to pay attention. Mm. And so well, Patrick and I were slogging on our bikes and so Zephyr was on the tandem with Patrick and so Woody, who was a baby, he just learned all of the food. So he would be going, in the beginning, he'd be going, oh, oh, oh. And then as he learned to speak more, he'd be going more, more, more. And then he was, you know, knew the names of the plants. So he'd be saying, look, locusts over there or 
you know, wild bananas over there or whatever it was that we were seeing that he was seeing first. He was our chief spotter. So that was a really wonderful adventure for us as a family and, yeah, really galvanised us as to how we wanted to live. We wanted to live more outside, less with electricity. We came home and we cut the legs off our kitchen table and we gave away all our chairs. <laughs> um, we just sit on cushions now around the table. Yeah. And bit by bit, we, I feel like we were on that trajectory anyway, but bit by bit I feel like because of that journey we, yeah, we've related to the world differently mm. and have seen ourselves as much more participants. And part of it was digging holes and burying our poo along the way and seeing that poo, especially when you're eating really good food, as a real gift to the earth mm. and there's something toxic that you just want to not smell and not look at and just send it away. So being, we now um, have three uh, human manure composting toilets on the property that Patrick mm. has built just out of very simple bucket systems. Mm. And that, again, has really helped helped me to feel part of the world because mm. I'm putting a part of myself back into the soil that then grows our food that then we eat and then the system, we, we call it closing the poop loop. But that's really helped me see myself as part of the world and part of but that's been a big part of my belonging story mm. and that emphasis on how important belonging is and how important it is to feel a real deep reciprocity and deep kinship to to land mm. and to country and we were went um, to the Jaburong Embassy to the protest about the trees that they were going to cut down all those birthing trees to widen the highway. And I had my period when we went and for one of the times and I squatted behind some trees and I did a wee and there was this bright red mm. patch of blood mm. on the ground and I burst into tears. It was such a a huge, how could I how could I have not done that before or, or seen that before or seen myself as part of, of what a gift that blood was to the, to the land? And that was my, my oath and my promise right there in that bit of blood. I mean, I use rags to, um, to like mop up the blood when I bleed, like gra our grandmothers used to do, mm. um, and I soak them and then I squeeze out the, you know, the, the, bloody water and I tip it on different trees around our property but that feels different mm. to actually see this come out of me mm. with such a, a sense of connection mm. yeah and that's been I've I mean that was only a few years ago but it's just again strengthened my resolve and my promise to be in service to the to the land mm. sometimes when we look at uh you know, the whole having to, having to give things up or giving things up as some sort of a, a loss. But I know that you look at it in a different way. And <laughs> instead of seeing it as giving something up, it's more in the sense of, well, what am I going to gain? What can I, what is that space going to create? Maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Absolutely. But it didn't start off like that. Hmm. It started off I was very fearful and very reluctant to to give things up. It felt like I was um, I was giving up a part of my civil self. Mm. I was becoming uncivilized in a way, mm. and that I was going back in time because I was giving up modernity. Mm. And you know, we live in Australia. It's a big country and how do we get around you have to have a car like it's just a, a no-brainer that you have to have one but when you take yourself out of that that felt like a really big step and not shopping at supermarkets there's that fear of going hungry and of course I could go into the supermarket at any time but there was at first when we made that decision and that decision came because we gave up hard plastics first 
then we gave up soft plastics and then we gave up all packaging and this is about a decade ago mm-hmm. and then it's like well we don't even need to go to the supermarket anymore we started making our own toilet paper with family cloth yeah and then I was using tampons and then I went to using rags yeah making a whole lot of stuff but in the beginning there's some things that were harder to give up than other things mm. so we first sold Patrick's car when we decided that we were going to do that and then we kept my car in the carport for a year and then we had a little log book and every time we used it we wrote down how many kilometers we drove and what we used the car for and at the end of that year we'd like oh well we can easily go without this so then that but that was a whole year of sort of holding on to it it was also had been my grandmother's car mm-hmm. so there was part of that connection to her too but definitely with everything Now that we give up and we still have lots more things that we would like to give up, there is a very strong sense of reclaiming, whether it's reclaiming a sense of ourselves as ecological creatures or a sense of time or when you you do things for yourself, and this is a big part of permaculture, Mm. there is just that sense of empowerment Mm. and I think what this pandemic has shown a lot of people is that when we rely on unstable centralized systems, we are vulnerable. Mm. But so we don't have that sense of vulnerability because we Mm. don't rely on those centralized systems. Mm. And we make, we have solar panels, we make our own electricity, we have water tanks, we don't have schools, we don't need to rely on the medical system. You know, we have in the past, we're not complete purists. But we don't want to put this any more strain than we have to on the medical system. Mm. And we have a lots a long list of things that we do every day or every week or every year, just the things that we do to make sure that we stay very, very healthy. Mm. And it's things like uh, we eat lots of fermented foods, mm. we grow our own food, we live uh, below the poverty line, and we only eat organic food. Mm. We um, we're outside a lot, so we're hardy, hardy to the weather, to the elements. We uh, we do cold water plunging, so mm. we kind of like the Wim Hof mm. method. So Patrick does the breathing as well. I don't like the breathing; I just like the cold water. Um, we play music. We are in service, so we have lots of different community groups that we're part of, mm. um, and different bush schools that we run, and different community groups that we facilitate. Do you have a meditation practice? No, we both have breathing yep. practices yep. that's really focused on the breath, but not meditation per se. But also I feel like we're active meditators yeah. more more well, than still meditators. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's a beautiful distinction to make between static meditation and then, you know, the whole purpose of engaging in a static meditation practice is to know who and what you are at that deepest level and to Mm. then live it in your daily life. And from everything that you've explained, the way you're living life is that deep connection to your own nature, deep connection to that being. And so it is in a way that state of meditation that you're living in rather than saying, oh, I have a meditation practice that I do. That's kind of separate from my life. There's there's no separation. Yes. Yeah. I, I like that. And just when you were talking just now, it made me think about also giving up so many things that we have done. We are now living much more in line with our values. Mm. and But we didn't set out to do that. That's sort of been a, a byproduct. And we didn't set out to live like this. We just knew what we were turning away from. We knew that we didn't want to be part of a culture that was destroying the world, but we didn't have where we are now as a goal in mind. And of course, this isn't the destination. I look forward to seeing us in another 14 years to see where we're at and, you know, what else have we given up? And yeah, I mean, of course, what will the world be like then? Yeah. And what will, yeah, we be like as as elders and Woody as, you know, a young adult? Mm. But I think a lot of the things that we've given up over time when we first moved into this house, we had uh, gas cooking, gas hot water, 
Mm -hmm. uh, gas heating. And that, yeah, we spent time in anti-coal seam gas blockade and it didn't feel right to come home and to turn the gas on. Mm. So we put things in place. We now have a wood oven that we use for everything. So that's for our hot water, for our kettle, for our toaster, for our dehydrator, for how it heats our hot water, heats our house, dries our clothes. Um, and we also like to say our TV because it's got a little wood box that we can look into. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it's eight or nine appliances and we get all of our wood from the common land around our house and that's on with our wheelbarrows or bicycle trailers or just arm loads. Mm. Um, but turning the gas off felt very, very important to do, but very scary because, yeah. you know, if something happens to Patrick, I actually don't know how to use a chainsaw. I know how to use an axe, but to, to see, yeah, to build relationships has also been a huge part of what we have gained by giving things up mm. because it has put us in relationship to the forest, mm. to the trees or what you know looking at the trees what what needs to come down what has come down mm. put us in relationship with the soil with the, the seeds because we grow most of our own food put us in relationship to we shop at um we've got a really fantastic food co-op in our town mm. in relationship with the volunteers with all of those growers who supply the co-op put us in relationship to all of our neighbors because we're much more in relationship with them because we don't have stuff. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's given us the time just to stop and have a chat. And, yeah, because we also have more skills now that we can be of service to our neighbours and our community. So we facilitate a, um, a monthly fermenting group. Mm -hmm. uh, we're part of our seed library, a free seed library. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have a free um, herbal, monthly free herbal medicine group that we also facilitate. Mm. Uh, Patrick facilitates a men's group and I facilitate a women and non-binary group. Mm. And we have a natural beekeeping group we facilitate. Mm. So we have these skills, but to have them in isolation doesn't make sense because what does it mean if we're well fed and we have all the honey and all the fermenting, fermenting skills, what is the point? But if we can do it in community and everybody is well around us, then that's much more enjoyable, much more practical, mm. and it also encourages the gift economy. So mm. we have about 80 or so different households that we are in some sort of gift exchange relationship with. Mm. So, and some of those relationships, it's very monitored. It's like, well, you've looked after my child once, I'll look after your child once. Mm. Um, some it's sort of part um, monitored. So I'll give you, um, you know, six of my duck eggs and you'll give me, you know, a bag of your walnuts. Mm. And then it, that's a sort of a rough exchange. And then Sometimes it's just, you know, here I've made a whole heap of butter or ghee or mm. milk kefir mm. and you just give me some homemade wine or whatever it is or, you know, a homemade mask or something that you've mm. made, you know, you've got a spare. So some, it, yeah, and it doesn't feel right with some people to be in an, um, to be just freely in that gift exchange. It feels right to be a bit more monitored and a bit careful with them mm. because I don't yet have that trust mm. and I've been in situations before when I've set up a kind of loose agreement it's like yeah I'll come and weed in your garden for an hour and if you could take your sewing machine and patch up my jeans but then that doesn't end up happening because your sewing machine needs a service and so you don't end up fixing my jeans and you never have said hey remember that time I did you did that in my garden I need to do your jeans so there's a bit of trust broken there in some relationships, but of course, I'm always open to trying again. Mm. But some people, it just feels like we're in that flow of gifts and that feels really great. And some, it's sort of on the way there. Mm. Mm. But just to have those relationships outside of the monetary economy, mm. yeah, it feels good to, 
to revalue, put value again back into the home and what we're creating here outside of the shackles of capital. Mm. And so fascinating because I feel like what people really want is connection. You know, we, we may have a lot of stuff. We may be kind of connected in ways, but really we're, we're lacking that deep connection and how interesting when you give up those things that have um, been sold to you to give you greater connection, you end up, you know, in some ways losing convenience, but reclaiming or regaining, you know, conscious attention mm. and relationship and community and appreciation and time. Mm. Oh, such a big one, such mm. a big one for people. Uh, Charles Eisenstein, uh, his latest book, which is called uh, the, more, the More Beautiful World, Our Hearts Know is Possible. Actually, he may have another more recent book, but yeah. in that book he talks a lot about the culture of separation and disconnection, which is the old story. Yeah. And the new story is where we're in connection and it's much more about relationship and about seeing ourselves as much more participants. And I feel like that time of grief that Patrick and I went through our World According to Monsanto uh, week also was, yeah, a real feelings that we really felt adrift between the two stories mm. and because we didn't know what the new story looked like. And I th- what you just said about people wanting connection and wanting to be in relationship, it's so possible. But the old story, the old habits, we're so deeply embedded in that. All of the the narratives, the major dominant narratives that we have about how we are to live are all rooted in the old story. Yeah. And we we all need role models who are living in that new story. Yeah. And of course, you there's the saying you need to see it to be it. Mm. And it's so important to share our feelings of of longing for connection and and how we're embedding ourselves in the new story. It's so important that we share these narratives because otherwise we're just left with yeah. Netflix and the Disney Channel. Yeah. And especially for our children, it's important. But, of course, for us too because we need to, to show our children and each other what, what's possible. So for those people that are feeling really connected to what you're saying, like it's very inspiring listening to you and to see what you guys have created. It's, you know, radical in many ways, uh, but kind of radically natural, interestingly <laughs> enough. Um, you know, and I feel like there is this, um, this movement that's taking place of people wanting to have a deeper connection to nature, more time, greater community, um, engagement. So for those people who have been feeling this in their hearts, may not yet have taken that first step, maybe there's some fear because it's, it's, it's kind of easy to have the idea, but to take that step, there could be that fear. So you know, what would you suggest for people for starting off? And um, do you have to kind of leave the city? Do you have to leave the city? Do you have to go to the country? Do you have to buy a piece of land? That's one of the things that I love about permaculture is that there there aren't rules, there are principles. There there isn't one blueprint to live to live according to. It's all about applying the principles to where we are now. And David Holmgren, the co-originator of permaculture, his latest book is called Retro Suburbia, A Downshifter's Guide to a Resilient Future. And the retro suburban model is about blooming where we are planted. It's about mm. creatively adapting in situ. What can we each do in our lives to live more in line with ecological processes and our own values? Whether it's saying hello to your neighbour as a start but even before that, I just wanted to say it's really important that we sit with our feelings. And I'm sure you, in meditation, it's a big part of it is just observe where am I at? 
why do I want to change? What is what is the point of changing? What do I want to be connected to? Is it other people? Is it a tree? Is it where your food comes from? I mean, it's so, of course, there's the, all the things we can do no matter where we live if we have it in our means, whether it's planting a broad bean or a garlic clove, mm-hmm. either in soil that's on our property, on our balcony, in a pot in our kitchen, near our kitchen sink, or where is the nearest wild space to where you live? Just to, we're all so domesticated. I feel like that's a big thing. And the more time we spend outside, in the cold, in the warmth, with the wind, with the insects, with the the flowers and the trees and the birds and and the the stenches of of rotting life, <laughs> whether it's compost, whether it's roadkill, I mean, it's all part of our world and. I don't want to say our reality, but this is this is the modern moment. And for us to for us in our household, we've really tried to deprogressize ourselves. So move away from what's considered progress. And of course, we still have internet, we still have electronics. Mm. You know, we we aren't living in in the isolated in the woods we are storytellers story sharers mm. we want to be connected but to to see ourselves as ecological beings is going to look different for everybody and mm. for some people it's going to be moving away from wearing synthetics to to wear more natural fibers mm. some people it's going to make sense to dance in the rain or to go barefoot or to not buy food that comes from far away, to only eat what's in season, Mm. Um, to walk instead of riding your bike or to ride your bike instead of driving in your car Mm. or smiling at someone who you've seen quite a few times but you've never felt confident enough to do that. Mm. But those little moments of our, I was going to say humanity, but it's our animal selves Mm. this virus has really made us all see our own frailties and vulnerabilities and the world is vulnerable and of course the world is strong and we are too but with systems collapse whole ecosystems collapsing you know we are part of that we we can't separate we can't take ourselves out of the picture just because we might see ourselves at the top of the food chain you know we are we're, we're all living in this world together and i think that's that's part of the animus perspective is that we're we're all part of this just because we're separate inside our houses mm. we're not really separate mm. we're not we're not isolated just because we're isolating at home mm. you know we're all interconnected mm. and you were speaking at the beginning about transition towns Yes. Is that something uh, people could look at? So the transition town movement came out of permaculture. Oh, really? I didn't yeah. know that. Fascinating. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so Rob Hopkins uh, lives in a town called Totnes in the UK. Mm-hmm. So he came up with the idea of a transition town, which is whole towns that are adapting to the realities of climate catastrophes and peak oil. And it's going to look different, like permaculture, without rules, only principles. The tra- each trans each town that is transitioning, and it's a transition away from pollution ideology to more ways of interbeing and much more uh, embedded ecologically. So, that, of course, that's going to look different for every town. Mm. So, for some towns, they've gone plastic bag free. For starters, for some they've got their own currency and it's a localized currency and you can trade and you can the local stores accept it and things like mm. that. For some they have their own repair cafe, they have their own um, community supported agriculture. In our town, we've got CSAs, community supported agriculture. We've got also got a CSB, a community supported bakery. Mm. Um, there's a community supported butchery as well. 
And what does this mean? What does CSA, CSB, what does that community supported mean? Uh, it's like a veggie box game. So a CSA is, well, it, it's different for every um, farm and every farmer, but it's usually on, along the lines of that you buy a subscription. So you can either pay weekly or pay at the beginning of every season and you just get a veggie box of whatever the farmer has got. Okay. So you're eating locally, you're in relationship with your farmer, you're in relationship with your biosphere. Mm. And if the farmer has, you know, if there's a fire or a flood or then you, you carry that weight as, along with the farmer. Okay. So mm. we have veggie, quite a few veggie box schemes where um, different farmers who do veggie boxes in our area. So, and with the uh, the bakery, you subscribe for a whole school term. So, and they have different loaves every week, or sometimes it's the same week, the same loaves that they have. And again, you're carrying the weight with the baker. And so, there's no waste as well. They're not making heaps more loaves because they know exactly how many that they have to make. Mm. Mm, love it. It's really great. I love that taking the pressure off taking the pressure off those people who are providing essential services to us, like feeding us uh, because of stress that farmers can go under because of, you know, weather um, changes, seasons, and what we're all doing to the environment, they're carrying that and that can be really stressful. So to have that community aspect, I love that. Absolutely That's right. love it. So with the bakery, um, Katie and Alison, who are friends of ours who run it um, and they they, were, they had about 50 or so different households who had weekly subscriptions. And then after the first lock, lockdown, that they had an extra 200 people wanting bread from them. Wow. So just that connection and it's all outside one of their houses that they put that, you know, they send a text message, yep, bread's here and everybody goes to collect it. And there's a meeting point, you know, it's a bit difficult now because everyone's social distancing and, <laughs> but it's still, it's a, it's a gathering place. It's a, a way to, be connect much more connected to where our food comes from and and the processes of of getting that. Mm, very cool, very cool. Oh yeah, so the the transition town. Um, so our HRN Hepburn Relocalization Network is a part of that. So we have all those different free workshops that I mentioned. Okay, um, yeah. We have, yeah, we have different film nights and um, panel events that we organise um, at our town hall, and yeah different food swaps we have community gardens you have all different aspects of that and yeah it's just it's a global network of towns who were engaging in different ways of being outside of the dominant cultures imperatives mm. and so people can just look that up um on the website like how would you start if you're like yes i want to transition my town what would that look like <laughs> uh, well you could just start something yeah. <laughs> and tell people about it yeah um so, or you could um have a look what other towns are doing so you could ha go to the transition town i think they've got a wiki or a there's a book as well the transition town handbook we will put the links to it all in the show notes of this podcast so um we can jump on jump on board so i'd love to talk about uh, what you mentioned at the very beginning about the complexity of living on unceded land, on stolen country, because we're talking about, you know, transitioning our towns and um, regenerating our land and living off the land. Uh, yeah, I would love to hear your perspective on this. It's complicated. And I was stuck in a a foul, guilty place for a very long time because I didn't know how to make sense of it. Mm. And it's remarkable to think that pre-1788 there was no, there were no mortgages, there was no homelessness, there was no poverty, there was no unemployment. And how do we bring ourselves back to that place? Mm. how do we get as close to that as possible to living as ecological creatures of place where yes that there were different um different mobs living in different areas and they had tandarums and they had different ceremonies between the two mobs to allow access to resources so there were territories 
and it wasn't quite private property, but it was still each bit of land was specific to each language group. So when we signed our mortgage, the ridiculousness of what we were doing, because it was a bit of paper that was based on a lie of Terra Nullius, Mm. because Terra Nullius is absolute bullshit because there were people living here and there were people growing food. It wasn't just flora and fauna and it wasn't just chancy hunter-gatherers. There were people living with intention and living as we are living now just in a far less, a completely less destructive way. And in very sophisticated systems. It wasn't uncivilised in any way. It was It was very intelligent. And how do we, when we think about Indigenous cultures of place, how do they live? How, how do they live and how did, yeah, how did they live? How do they live? There's much more of a sense of kinship with the, with the natural world, mm. doing as little, living as carbon positively as possible. Mm. There's having a sense of wonder for the world, being present to the world. Mm. There's a, a sense of uh, ceremony. There were rituals. There was an honouring of the world. Mm. And we, I really feel like for us it's having a mortgage on unceded land is so we can enact our own sense of earth honouring culture on this land. Mm. So it's not, you know, signing that mortgage was not a decision that we made lightly at all, Mm. but having tenure of this land on this land has meant that we can enact, we can teach, we have, um, you know, three or four tiny houses where people come and live non-monetarily on this land. Mm. And and it's the carbon consciousness and it's the, the earth-honouring ways and really looking at Jarrah culture, so we live on Jarrah land, looking at Jarrah culture for for signs, for clues, for for help, for guidance, really looking at Jarrah elders to say we are we are we would love to be instructed on on how we can live. But until we until we have that, until we really form and solidify those relationships, we're just looking around us and seeing different all the different ways that we can live and we can participate on Jarrah country that is respectful and that is honouring and that is accountable mm-hmm. to to our to the land and to our relationship with it. And being producers and not consumers, being walkers instead of drivers, being growers instead of shoppers has been a real way back for us to be in relationship with with the land in a way that feels respectful to the original inhabitants of of this land. Mm. We had a very similar thing uh, when we bought this property just at the end of um, last year. And this is 30 acres. We're on 30 acres here. It's huge and it's pretty much just bush just bushland and there's a little cleared cleared part in the middle of where we live and it felt really weird like it mm. felt really weird to think that um we own this land and and I couldn't have that thought in my mind it just would it wouldn't it wouldn't stick you know it's like how um how did how did it come to this like how were we privileged using that word privileged or blessed or the karma, we may say as well. How did it come to this point that we're here doing this? And and whose land was this before? Mm-hmm. You know, not the people that bought it, but who was this land um, owned by before? What families were here? I mean, was it used? I, we don't really know the history of where we are right here, right now. Um, we know it up to a certain point, but not before that. And so we've we've been connecting with the local Watawarung 
organization, Aboriginal organization, to be able to connect with traditional owners, to be able to learn more. But there's still, yeah, inside, it's still something doesn't sit right mm-hmm. to feel like, why do I get to live this way? And those who were here before us, whose land was stolen, they don't. And it's like, well, do I just give the land away? Do I give it back? Like, do we cut it up and kind of, I don't know. And that, that's something I haven't reconciled inside myself yet. But what a great, what great questions. Yeah. What a, what a huge and difficult journey mm-hmm. because it's, yeah. But again, the more privilege, the more responsibility. Yeah. So how do we, and also to, to look at our own ancestors, to look at, cause, because we all came from first peoples yes. once. And so to look at how our first peoples lived on country mm. respectfully with, with reverence mm. and to, of course, we can look to the Wathawurrung or Jara elders and ancestors of the land the countries that we're on yeah but also we know we know all of us know in our hearts Mm. how we are to live Mm. and we've just been schooled in the opposite so it's there's so much untangling that we all have to have to do and it's such a you know, my tangling was different to your tangling, so my untangling is going to look different to yours. Yeah. But to know that so many people are, are going through the same thing mm. is very helpful. Mm. And, to you know, for some people it makes sense to pay the rent and to give money to their local um, Indigenous corporation or to different charities or different individuals in, that makes sense for them and for others we plant the rent. So we plant lots of, Mm. you know, native trees here or, you know, lots of so many different ways. I think, as you said, not shying away from those emotions like that, that guilt, that fear, that shame, that um, like holy shit kind Mm of (laughs) what, like what are we unpacking here to not, to not look away from that. Yes, and two books that I found really, really helpful. Mm. Um, one was Braiding Sweetgrass mm. by Robin Wall Kimmerer. I don't know if you've read that. And the other one was Sand Talk by Tyson Yunkaporter. Uh, two books written by Indigenous people, one North American, one Indigenous Australian, that, that I just found so helpful, so much wisdom and humour and just common sense. Mm. that we have just lost touch with. Yeah, I feel that. I feel that. There's like a real coming home. Mm. Interesting enough, um, when this whole coronavirus thing started uh, you know, earlier in the year, there are a lot of um, Vedic astrologers who were looking at what the planets were doing and, and uh, giving a perspective on what's happening from that, that bigger picture evolutionary aspect of of consciousness and uh they said that this time that we're in the reason why all this is taking place is for everyone to come back to nature to Mm. come back to their own nature to come back to the land and to realize what um what systems are actually not serving in in the sense of nourishment nourishment of of individuals and collective and the importance of divesting from yeah. all of those systems, yes. one by one. <laughs> yeah. Just how, yeah, that's, and I feel like our mortgage is our last, our last big one. Okay. Yeah. You know, we still have rates to pay. Yeah. But that's just been how many of these toxic, <laughs> life destroying systems, yeah. and there are a lot of them, and even just to list them one by one and check them off. <laughs> yeah good place to start right yes and as you do that it's very empowering like you do step into greater empowerment resilience um confidence and connection is that not what we're all wanting (laughs) yes it is Mm. 
anything anything else you would suggest for people on this journey any piece of advice that you would you'd want to leave with people something that just yeah is resonating in your heart right now start small mm. i would i would say learn one edible weed that is growing in your pedosphere which is your local ped as in walking like your your walker sphere <laughs> mm. learn one one weed and learn all the different aspects of how it grows what it means about the soil if it means that it's alkaline or acidic what you can do with it is it medicinal is it edible is it good to use for natural dyeing for fiber for clothing i feel like the more people learn about wild foods and weeds hopefully it will lead to us being much more conscious of the soil and when we befriend weeds we won't want to poison the soil feral foods give you feral energy and we all need tenacity more than any anything at the moment we need courage we need wildness undomestication we need to shop at supermarkets less less reliance on centralized systems what weeds grow in different seasons all weeds just represent such a great way to form connection mm. so i would say learn one weed and if you know lots learn one more or mm. teach people mm. share what you have once you've learned it share what you have because that's the commons of course i mean all the different workshops we run are all non-monetary mm. of course we're low income we could do with paying off our mortgage faster but to put things back into the gift economy to be in such a place of trust and such a place of mm. unknown reciprocity yeah. and i feel like you, we can see the flower and the insect as just nuts and bolts of one is you know the flower puts out a nice scent so the the bee will come and pollinate and mm. or we could see it as a gift to the bee and the bee gives that gift of pollination back to the flower it's all about reframing and so to see ourselves as part of the gift of the world from the world to the world that's mm. what we all are and to find our gifts to be in service to the world but start with a weed is a really, mm. a really humble reminder of our own weediness mm. <laughs> on 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 first people's country as well Mm, so beautiful. Well, thank you so much for taking the time um, to share your your wisdom, your experience, your humanity, your compost heap. Thank you for <laughs> showing me your compost heap today. I have learned so much. <laughs> if people want to connect with you um, and kind of follow on the the journey that you guys are taking, where would we find you? Yep, I'm part of a collective called Artist as Family. So mm. we have a blog, we're on uh, social media, we've got a YouTube channel. Mm. So, yeah, so just Artist as Family is probably the best place. And if people have any questions, um, our email address or they could just uh, is on our blog or put in a comment somewhere and, yeah, because love good questions. So good. Is Artist as Family your family or there's more people? Uh, no, it's our family. It's you guys, yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Um, thank you so much. This has been amazing. It's been so inspiring just on my level of um, personal experience. Uh, yeah, I've taken a lot from this and I'm so looking forward to getting Alex to listen to this conversation. <laughs> I seem to be a little, a little more um, radical, I guess, in this, in this movement towards change than he is. That's been actually a really interesting thing to navigate in a relationship when one person is really you know like ready to go like you know ready to let, let it go give it up invite people on the land start an intentional community like let's do this and yeah patrick and i take our turns one of us says let's give this up and let's do this and let's give this and we're also some of the things that he says it's like whoa <laughs> oh, and some of the things i say he's like uh uh-uh, uh not not ready for that yet so What's you one know, of the things he said that you're just like, no, I cannot do that? Well, initially for that big bike trip, 
Yeah. He, when he said it, I'm like, I'm sorry. There's no way. We've got a little baby. He's just started sleeping through the night. I'm not disturbing that. <laughs> wow. That was a big thing. Mm. But you did it. No, we did it. Absolutely, we did it. Yeah, but but just to gently, gently. Yeah. And to, yeah, I mean, they talk about permaculture divorce too. Often it happens after um, a cup, one person in a couple has done a PDC yeah. and they come back with all these ideas and the other person's like, I'm sorry, there is just no way we are getting rid of our toilet. I'm not going to shit in a bucket. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or whatever it is. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not giving up the TV or whatever. <laughs> so if you can find ways to gently mm. bring each other on mm. because it's, yeah, there's what what's the fear, I guess? What's the fear of of that moving away from what's known? It's the uncertainty. It's money. It's money. Yeah. I, I think it's definitely money. And it's being a man in this world, you yeah. know, what it means to be a man and to yes. provide and be yes. stable and successful. Yes. All of that. So Pat- Patrick doesn't work in the monetary economy at all. He's seven mm. days in the home economy. Mm. And so for him, I mean, he's the most manliest man I know. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> he's, you know, he's the provider because he he's our main gardener. He provides all of the, the wood for the fire. Yeah. That for all of those appliances, so he's a provider, but in a just a different way. Yeah, and also he's provides safety, you know, because he's the man. <laughs> and <laughs> I love, I love my job. I love working yeah. in the monetary economy for two days a week. That yeah. really suits me. Um, and Patrick doesn't want to do it, so that that makes sense. But I can see how that's it can be challenging when you're deeply embedded in who you when who you are is embedded in what you what you were doing instead of who you are yeah and maybe it's just rewriting that story Mm. it's just saying it's like this is very manly and this is very like this is strength like you can't eat money like if you're looking after us here brilliant like all yeah. you know the banks could shut down in a moment everything could yes. disappear that we've ever that we've ever earned and what have you yeah. got to show for it you know yeah so that is actually that's providing in the true sense in the true true sense yes. of it and it's just I guess re reframing reframing that having those discussions mm, very nice mm. thank you for that good thank you thank you Laura uh, you're welcome. Thank you. I really look forward to meeting you. Um, Likewise. At some point, we'll have to come up and, um, yeah, we'd love, love to connect. great. Yeah. Thank I'd you so much. I'd love that. Oh, this was very nourishing. So nice. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Thanks for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed what we were communing about and want to hear more, then please subscribe to the Mahasoma podcast. And if you have some time, then please leave a review. We would love to hear from you. And it will also help to share this podcast with those looking for a new perspective. If you'd like to find out more about Mahasoma or learn Vedic meditation with our collective of teachers, then head to mahasoma.com or you can follow us on Instagram at mahasoma or connect with us at facebook.com forward slash mahasoma community. Together, we are a collective, a community of like-minded, heart-centered humans weaving into the tapestry of life, new ways of being and living through the exploration of timeless wisdom and the sharing of stories. We aspire to uplift and support a new generation of conscious, empowered and purposeful humans. Maha Soma is all about Exploring new cultural narratives to help you find a new normal. Together, we rise in love.